We'll go on to retinal breaks uh, from Jenny Lim from UIC. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks for your leadership on this wonderful PPP panel uh, committee in which I serve and have really lots of fun with my fellow committee members here. So we'll discuss retinal breaks. I, these are my financial disclosures, the relevant one of which is Alcon. Today I'd like to go over three peripheral breaks, atrophic coals, horseshoe tears, and traumatic retinal breaks. Let's look at this first patient. This is a 21-year-old patient who's mildly myopic and was found to have a retinal hole without vitreous traction. This was on a routine exam and the patient had no symptoms. So what would you do? You can see here the hole with the operculum next to it. So atrophic holes are actually found in about 5% of the population. They're asymptomatic in the majority of patients and they have a very benign course. Very rarely do they re lead to retinal detachment. And in fact, Dr. Beyer followed 46 asymptomatic eyes with operculated breaks over 11 years, and Davis followed 28 eyes up to five years in which the fellow eye already had an RD, and none of these 74 eyes progressed to retinal detachment. So the recommendation by the PPP is that you should observe these atrophic asymptomatic holes. Atrophic round holes can be followed at one to two year intervals. If it's in a newly operculated hole without symptoms, see the patient back in one to four months. If there still is no fluid and no symptoms, see them back in six to 12 months and then follow annually. Here's an example of an atrophic round hole. You can see that there's a cystic tuft <clears throat> just beyond the hole, but the hole itself is atrophic. And it's very important that you depress these holes and move from anterior to posterior so that you can clearly see that this is an atrophic hole. And this image comes from the collection of Dr. Norm Beyer. Let's turn now to a different scenario. This is a 50-year-old man who presents with an acute posterior vitreous detachment. And we heard very eloquently from Dr. Edelman about acute PVDs. In this situation, the patient had an atrophic hole found. He did have symptoms of the acute PVD. There were no areas of traction, however, to the hole, and the hole looked pre-existing. So what do you do? Well, we found in the PPP that there really is no randomized study to guide treatment in this situation. So the recommendation is, if you see such a patient who has symptoms and there is subretinal fluid, consider treating this hole. If the patient is highly myopic, again, treat this hole. If the fellow eye had a retinal detachment, consider treating this hole. Now what about if there's vitreous traction to the edge of the hole, as seen in this example? Then the consensus is treat this because there's a higher risk of progression to retinal detachment. You also want to ask yourself, is there vitreous traction to vessels at the edge of the hole? If the answer is yes, then again treat because there is now known that there is a higher risk for progression to retinal detachment in this situation. And this is one of my patients in which you can see the laser surrounding the hole um, in, with the traction next to the vessels. So follow-up of these patients, you want to see them two to four weeks after the treatment, then one to three months, six to 12 months after that, and then follow them annually. What about a patient who presents in this fashion? Patient's a 50-year-old woman who complains of new onset floaters in her right eye. You do a depressed exam and you see this horseshoe break. What do you do? Well, it's very well known that if you do not treat a horseshoe tear, there's a high risk of retinal detachment. This patient was symptomatic and the evidence shows that 50% of symptomatic horseshoe breaks will progress to a retinal detachment if you do not treat them. What if the patient were asymptomatic and you found a horseshoe tear? The evidence shows that 5% will progress to a retinal detachment. So the consensus is that these are rather high rates of retinal detachment and the recommendation is to treat these patients. Let's look further at the evidence for untreated horseshoe tears. In a review by Davis of the natural history of retinal breaks without detachment at presentation, we see that 176 breaks were left untreated. Of these, some had considered no retinal detachment, that is, subretinal fluid less than or equal to one disc diameter surrounding the horseshoe tear. There are also eyes included with subclinical retinal detachment. 
and these were defined as subretinal fluid greater than one distameter around the tear, but less than or equal to two distameters posteriorly to the equator. Davis followed these 176 untreated breaks without clinical detachment for six months or more. The rate of retinal detachment was 18%. Of the ones that detach, there was a higher risk of progressing to retinal detachment if this break was a fresh symptomatic horseshoe tear. The rate then was 30%. It was also higher if the break had subclinical fluid, as described earlier, and the rate there was 35%. If the patient was aphakic and had had cataract extraction, the rate was 50% with the horseshoe tear. So we really don't want to see this. We don't want to see a horseshoe tear progress to a retinal detachment as shown on this slide. And we know that treatment can prevent progression. There is good evidence supporting the treatment of horseshoe tear. Again, untreated, these breaks will progress. And when you see these patients, they'll have rolled edges, increasing subretinal fluid, and often progress to retinal detachment. Here's a list of patients, uh, series rather, of eyes that were treated, and we can see on the far right, the numbers are, are small, but I'll read them off to you. There are approximately five to 7% that with treatment will progress to a retinal detachment, and that's much smaller than the 50% of symptomatic retinal tears. In a study by Robertson and Norton of treated retinal breaks, that is 301 breaks treated with laser or cryo and followed six months to nine years, only 6% developed a retinal detachment. And the vast majority of these, about two thirds, occurred within the first six months. So that's something you can tell your patients after you treat them, if they get through the first six months, then the risk does decrease for developing a retinal detachment. After you treat these patients, see them one to two weeks after the laser or cryo. If they're doing well, see them back in another four to six weeks. After that, three to six months, and then annually. This is a situation where there's a bridging vessel that increases the risk of vitreous hemorrhage. This is a variant of a horseshoe tear with a bridging vessel. Know that if you see these patients, there's a higher risk of retinal-associated uh, hemorrhage or vitreous hemorrhage. Chronic horseshoe tears, again, the evidence for that is that the edges will be rolled. There may be pigment around the tear. Now, if you do see pigment surrounding the lesion and you don't see subretinal fluid beyond the pigment, that's indicative of a chronic horseshoe tear and you can observe that eye. What about traumatic breaks? We frequently see patients who have had trauma to the eye and we can see a retinal dialysis as shown here. The consensus of the committee on review of the literature is that these are symptomatic. They're basically managed similarly to symptomatic tears. Therefore, treat the dialyses, and make sure when you treat the dialyses that you send the treatment over the entire length of dial dialysis and reach the ora serrata beyond each horn and edge of the retinal dialysis. If, however, you see a patient who is asymptomatic and is found to have a chronic dialysis, these can be either treated or untreated. There's not good evidence either way. If you decide not to treat them, you can see the patient back in one to four weeks then three months, then six months, and every six months after. If you do treat them, again, one to two weeks after treatment, then four to six weeks, then three to six months, and then annually afterwards. So what are the important questions to ask when you see a break in the retina? Obviously, we heard again from Dr. Edelman about the symptoms of PVD, so make sure you ask them if they're symptomatic, i.e. flashing lights, do they have floaters? Ask if there's a family history of retinal detachment so that you can get a genetic disorder such as Stickler's syndrome. Ask about prior eye trauma, myopia, whether they had recent surgery, including refractive surgery, because sometimes patients undergo refractive surgery or cataract surgery, and their prescription may no longer reflect the fact that they're a high myope, yet they really did have high myopia to start with. Also ask about a history of YAG capsulotomy or other YAG, perhaps YAG lasers to floaters. Also intravitreal injection should be asked for. When you examine the patients, it's important to look in the vitreous for evidence of pigment, red blood cells, or retinal detachment. So use a contact lens examination, either contact or even a non-contact exam to do careful biomicroscopy. 
Peripheral depressed examination is extremely important and cannot be overemphasized in these situations. And here's some examples of the peripheral depressed exam. And again, this is a dynamic exam. So you want to very consistently go around 360 degree, getting each clock hour, and also moving your depressor from anterior to posterior so that you can tell whether there is fluid surrounding the hole, whether there's vitreous traction at the edge of the hole, or vitreous traction on the vessels around the hole itself. Wide field color fundus photography sometimes is helpful in patients who are difficult to examine and may be able to give you a clue as to what's happening beyond where you can see. B-scan ultrasound is also extremely helpful. If a patient has a vitreous hemorrhage, you want to see them weekly. Perform ultrasound and scleral depressed examinations weekly until the hemorrhage is resolved or the aura can be clearly seen. Here's an example of a B-scan ultrasound. In the yellow arrow in the bottom, you can see a little area of hyperreflectivity coming off the posterior surface, and that is a retinal flap. On the right with the white arrow, you can see that there's vitreous adherent to the flap. Retinal tears, retinal flaps would look hyperreflective on that interface, and that's the clue on the B-scan ultrasound. So now you've identified your tear, you've figured out which groups are high risk, which ones need to be treated. How do you do the laser? Well, you can, or how do you do the treatment? You can do laser or you can do cryotherapy. Doing this reduces the risk of retinal detachment from approximately one in three overall to about one in 20. So it's highly effective. The technique is to use a contact lens with a viscous gel such as goniosol or you could use saline. Use the lightest burn possible to get a good retinal take. Usually the spot size is 200 microns. I usually start with a power of 200 milliwatts and put about three rows to completely surround the tear. It's extremely important when you're lasering to surround these tears that you reach the anterior horns of the tear. You wanna treat up to the aura serrata as needed and make sure the spots are close but not necessarily overlapping. Some of us do use encircling confluent laser, that's another option you can do, and it is okay to treat over the retinal vessels. Most important thing is to wall it around 360 degrees. So what lens do you use? Well, magnification and image size will vary. The lenses such as the Mainster Focal Grid, the Volk Aero Centralis, or the Goldman 3 mirror can be used, and these essentially induce no significant magnification. If, however, you're gonna use lenses such as the quad, the super quad, or the ultra field, know that you should decrease your laser beam in half because this essentially doubles the size using these lenses. Also, don't forget the Goldman image through the center is upright, but the other wider field images invert the image, and uh, just make sure you remember that. In terms of follow-up, make sure to evaluate the treatment scar about two weeks to four weeks to determine the adequacy of chorioretinal adhesion. And don't be afraid to add more laser if you see progression of fluid or an inadequate take. So eyes with atrophic holes, lattice degeneration with holes or asymptomatic horseshoe tears in patients in whom the follow eye has had a retinal detachment, see them every six to 12 months. In addition, just because you treated a break or just because you detected a break doesn't mean the patient is safe from developing new breaks. In fact, five to 14% of these patients will develop additional tears. And these new breaks may be particularly likely in eyes that have had cataract surgery. So you have to be very vigilant and OCD for searching for these. We know that earlier diagnosis of these tears will result in better outcomes. And we need to tell the patients, therefore, the signs and symptoms and the need for this prompt evaluation and treatment. And also tell your patients that they still can develop another break and therefore the follow-up is important. In a study by Smitty of 171 eyes in 164 patients with treated retinal breaks, he found that the treatment failure rate was higher in pseudophagic eyes, aphagic eyes, and eyes with peripheral retinal abnormalities in the follow eye. And in fact, 38% had follow eye abnormalities at baseline, and 5% developed them in the follow eye. So let me just highlight here uh, some of the recommendations, and they are asymptomatic, atrophic, or percolated retinal breaks rarely treat. You can observe these eyes. Atrophic round holes with lattice or minimal subretinal fluid without progression or PVD, we recommend no treatment. 
However, if it's an acute horseshoe retinal tear, treat the eye. If it's a traumatic break, usually also treat the eye. Our goal is to create a firm chorioretinal adhesion surrounding the retinal tear and the attached adjacent retina. Make sure to extend the treatment all the way to the aura and make sure to get anteriorly 360 degrees. And then make sure to follow up these patients because five to 15% will develop additional breaks. Thanks for your attention.